Biblical Priorities We are never to allow material possessions to keep us from making God and His will a priority in our lives. Here's Gene to explain. In this principle, of course, the key word is, or I should say words, are material possessions. Because it grows out of a specific illustration here. Now let me simply say that material possessions is one of God's greatest gifts to us. You know, when He created Adam and Eve, He put them in the garden. He, it was a beautiful garden. It was, there were so many wonderful things for their sustenance and for their uh, enjoyment. And we need material things to survive. But here is the, the key point that grows out of this, this principle, and that is that when material possessions take control of our lives, becomes the center of our lives. When that happens, that can impact all of our decisions and all that we do. And it can lead us out of the will of God when we get our priorities out of order. Now, Jesus has a, a case in point here where He's illustrating this principle. And it involves uh, what some Gospels call the rich young ruler. Uh, Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark has the same record, but there he, he's, the implication is he was a rich young ruler. Probably, by the way, a ruler in the synagogue. And you need to understand that many of these Pharisees who were rulers and leaders in the synagogue were the most wealthy individuals in Israel. And we must hurry on to say that a lot of their wealth was not gained with good ethics or spiritual principles. And Jesus really addresses that in their lives and other places. But here's a rich young ruler that seems to be sincere. Give him the benefit of the doubt. And he comes with a question. In Matthew 19, 16, just then someone and we know, as I said from Mark's Gospel, it was a young ruler, rich young ruler. Just then someone came up and asked him, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? That was the initial question. Now Jesus responded to that knowing exactly what's in his heart, knowing exactly how he's thinking, knowing exactly his motives. And you need to understand that in these situations because Jesus recited the, the law, several of the laws regarding murder and adultery and stealing and uh, bearing false witness and honoring father and mother. And he just said, well, I've kept all those from my youth. And so Jesus addresses this second question. Here it is. I have kept all these, the young man told him. What do I still lack? Now, I think, first of all, you need to understand, from the whole of Scripture, and even from the Gospels, Jesus goes on to say, if you want to be perfect, none of us are perfect. None of us can become perfect. He's really testing him. Because he probably thinks he's pretty close to perfect. The fact of the matter is, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we need salvation by grace through faith. But Jesus is addressing him and his motives and his heart. When he says, do you want to be perfect? Jesus said to him, go sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. And perhaps he is saying here, if you want to be like these other men, like Peter, who gave up his fishing business, like James and John who gave up their fishing business, like Matthew who was a tax collector, come follow me. When the young man heard that, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. It's interesting that in no way did he even stop and say, Jesus, I don't understand that. I really want to follow you. I really want eternal life, but 
I don't understand. And by the way, I don't know if he knew Zacchaeus. Say, when Zacchaeus, that rich uh, tax collector, when he was up there in that tree and Jesus said, come down, I want you to go to your house today, and he became a believer. Now, he made a lot of things right, but he never sold everything he had. You see, you have to look at and compare this with other illustrations. He's dealing specifically with this man's motives, where his heart is. And then here's the lesson. See, the disciples are listening in, because He's teaching them while He's teaching this one man. Jesus said to His disciples, Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now a lot of people try to explain the eye of the needle, and there's a lot of myths surrounding that. This is just an exaggerated metaphor. He's talking about a camel going through the eye of a needle, just to really get the point across. Jesus would often use that kind of exaggeration. But He does it to get attention and for more questions. When the disciples heard this, they were utterly astonished and asked, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. It is impossible for us to do anything to be saved except to accept the gift that God gives us through grace. So Jesus is teaching a very, very important thing here in relationship uh, to material possessions. Now we need to know, and let me summarize, what Jesus was not teaching. Jesus was not teaching a doctrine of poverty in order to be saved. That's impossible. That's works. And on another occasion, Jesus, in John 3.36, He says this, The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. It's not the one who sells all of his possessions and follows Me. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. And at this particular point in time, this young ruler, rich young ruler, probably doesn't even really believe that Jesus Christ was indeed the incarnate Son of God, just a good teacher. Here's a second thing he was not teaching. Jesus was not teaching that poverty makes us more spiritually mature. The fact of the matter is, it can create the opposite. Poverty is a horrible thing. Now there are people that grow closer to God through difficulties in those circumstances. But generally, poverty is a very difficult thing. What we're talking about here is those who develop this system among particularly the monks and the religious leaders who believed that if they sold everything and went into hibernation in some castle somewhere and took a vow of poverty, that that was going to make them more spiritually mature. God doesn't teach that. Now what is he teaching? Well, he's certainly not teaching that riches are wrong. We have great examples of very wealthy people in the New Testament who came to Christ that God used tremendously because of their wealth. Men like um, Cornelius, very wealthy Gentile. Uh, men like Philemon, a very wealthy man in uh, Colossae that came to Christ. In fact. Paul wrote from prison and said, Philemon, prepare a guest room for me. He was a man who had servants. He was very wealthy. But he was a true follower of Jesus Christ. And he used his wealth to glorify God. So what was Jesus teaching? Well, first, we must not allow our personal fleshly desires to keep us from having a personal relationship with God. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you're not careful, whoever you are, and you have wealth, you put that first, and it may keep you from going through that needle's eye, as it were, into eternal life because of your wealth. You feel so independent, so self-fulfilled, so arrogant that it's going to keep you from God. That certainly is a part of what he's teaching here. But secondly, Jesus was teaching this, 
As believers, we are always to maintain a proper priority on our material possessions. And that's what he meant in, I believe, uh, Matthew uh, 6.33. When he said this, But seek first, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Jesus knew that young, rich ruler was not willing to do that. He knew his heart. Now hopefully, later on, when the church was born, that this young man saw the truth and became a believer, and that's very highly possible. Paul addressed this in his letters to Timothy. First Timothy, first of all, he, he throws out a warning to those who crave money. This is Paul writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And this is what he says, but those, and he's talking about believers, who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. There are believers who have experienced a, a, a self-destructive kind of lifestyle because their one major motive is to love money. And that's what Paul is talking about. It's not money, per se. It's the love of money. And so he says, continuing, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, that's a strong word, craving it, some have wanted away from the faith, pierced themselves with many griefs. So Paul addresses Timothy as he's ministering to people and to believers, and he says, you know, Warn those who are craving money. That becomes their priority. They're heading for trouble. And it's out of the will of God. But then he addresses those who have wealth. And Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Instruct those who are rich to sell everything they have and follow Jesus. Is that what he says? No. Because that's not what Jesus really meant in relationship to the plan of salvation in the Christian life. Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of their wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. God has given us these things to enjoy, but not to set our heart on them. He says this, instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share. I thank God for people of wealth who love Jesus. Because people of wealth who love Jesus Christ and put Him first can do tremendous things to build the kingdom of God. Things that many of us cannot do without that kind of support. Money and ministry go hand in hand. You see that throughout the Scriptures. And so Paul is addressing that with Timothy. Storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of what is truly life. And I think most of us know stories and reports, many studies, that wealth, per se, doesn't bring fulfillment and happiness. There are people who commit suicide, and they're some of the wealthiest people in the world because they haven't found true fulfillment. Well, here's a reflection response question, and that is, what specific steps can we take to keep material possessions from standing in the way of our decisions to live in the will of God? To answer this question, I'm just going to encourage you on your own time to take your Life Essential Study Bible, go to the book of uh, 2 Corinthians and look at principle 16 that comes from chapter 9. And in one chapter, in a letter to the Corinthians, the second letter, Paul gives us at least nine guidelines to answer that question, to be able to practice this principle of putting God first with our material possessions.